Okay, let's get started. Uh, before we uh, dive into Acts, let's ask the Lord for their illumination for his blessing. So pray with me. Our dear Lord, as we once again dive into this uh, absolutely fantastic book, so much for us to learn, so much for us to learn this evening as we continue with Stephen's um, a sermon, and uh, we'll be here for a while to try to reap the benefit of not just seeing a, a beautiful sermon in the way that it is presented for us, but also the, the presentation of the gospel and um, a, a model for us to follow when we do the same. So I just pray that um, as we go through this evening and as we go through for the rest of the time that we are in this part of Acts, that you will truly um, place us um, into the, uh, the mindset, try to find the mindset that Stephen has as he, um, uh, as he delivers his sermon to the Sanhedrin just moments before um, he leaves this world and joins you in that. So we ask your blessing upon uh, our study this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, we are in the seventh chapter of um, of Luke, I'm sorry of Acts, and um, we are going to actually begin the um, the the sermon proper. Uh, we've we've done an awful lot of uh, leading up to it. We've talked an awful lot about Stephen, about uh, his arrest, about the relationship uh, with uh, both the church and with the. Um, the religious leaders, and so we're actually, uh, I'm just going to do a, a short review of the prologue that uh, Luke gives us, um, and then we're going to dive right in. So let me go ahead and read. Um, we are in the, the first through the eighth verses right now of chapter seven. So let me go ahead. I'll just read all of them. We're not going to make it through all um, eight verses tonight, uh, but we'll, we'll get a good start on it as we begin to dive into this. And, and if you'll notice, uh, Stephen is going to take us through different segments of, uh, of redemptive history. Um, and so we're going to concentrate on Abraham tonight, and that's the reason I'm reading these first eight verses. Uh, starting in the first verse. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans or Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And may the Lord bless that reading of his word. Now, you may ask yourself, and I don't know that I've, I've ever mentioned this to you. You may ask yourself, well, why do we have to read these same verses, you know, each time we start? Why don't we just read the verses we're going to deal with? I mean, pro probably the first and the second verses tonight. How come we don't just uh, read that and not read through the whole thing? Well, there, there's, there's method in that madness. Somebody asked John MacArthur one time how he gained his, his just in-depth knowledge of Scripture. Have you ever seen the man preach? He preaches with an open Bible and he just flips back and forth to the places. He knows exactly where everything is. And, and I, I've, I've kind of taken to heart what his response was is he, he would take a, a chapter at a time or four chapters at a time and he would read it through every night for like a month. The, the same chapter he would read over and over and over and over again 
And because of that repetition, it would stick in his mind. Then he would go on to the next and the next and the next. Rather than, you know, reading a book straight through, which is also good to do to get the oversight, he would uh, pick up a, a, a portion of it and read it through. So when we take, for instance, these first eight verses, by the time we get through these eight verses, we probably will have read it a dozen times, you, you know, um, all the way through, which helps this stick. Um, in our heads because there's an awful lot of information in the age in which we live that is fighting to get inside our heads more so than in, in, in any other generation that has ever existed on this planet. There is an overload of information and most of it is worthless uh, and, and I don't think most generations have have been inundated, bombarded with as much worthless information um, as we are. And the trouble with someone like me is when you put it in one ear, something comes out the other. You know, I can only hold so much in my mind and uh, in my head and I start to lose stuff because uh, I've used up my memory. So uh, I like to do this. I like to reread uh, uh, the passages um, that we have. All right, so let me bring you up to date to where we are. First of all, you know that Stephen has been arrested. He's been taken before the Sanhedrin. He was arrested by the Helen, or he was, it was, the reason for the arrest was that a group of Greek Jews were jealous of him and um, did not like his doctrine. So he stirred up a mob. The mob caused a scene, and so the Sanhedrin took the opportunity to arrest him. So he was brought before the Sanhedrin, and they brought false witnesses in there to accuse him of basically two different things. Um, one was that he was blaspheming God because he was teaching that the temple was um, uh, what was no longer the place where God could be found. It was through Jesus Christ and that blasphemed God because that was, they still thought at the time and there's, you know, Jesus certainly showed reverence for the temple, called it his father's house. So at least in some sense, it still was the place where God came to be in the midst of his people. And so they said, because you are teaching that the temple is no longer the place that sacrifices are no longer needed, that Jesus is the temple. They were he was blaspheming God. And, and, and the second um, uh, thing that they were upset about was that he was teaching new doctrine. He wasn't upholding the doctrines uh, of uh, Moses and they said Moses and God, but uh, um, really they are focused on their own traditions, their own teachings, and not necessarily just staying absolutely um, 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 pure or, or true to the teachings of God. Um, so uh, what, we, what we learned, uh, or we got started on the prologue, if you will, to this sort of an overview, and we talked about some things like, for instance, that this was the most complete sermon that we have run into to date, that we have sermons from Peter, um, uh, but they're just snippets. They're, there's not a full presentation of a sermon. So um, we, 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 we can take notes uh, of the way that a, a, a full thought is being brought out um, even under the most duress. We also noticed that um, Stephen chose to go into history, redemptive history, when he is working towards the gospel, and that's what we're going to see, that, that he's got a plan, he's got a purpose, and it's not just to give a history lesson. He, he's sharing the gospel, and he's doing it in a way that his audience, the Sanhedrin, will understand. And so um, he's using history, redemptive history, covenantal history, to, um, to make an argument for Jesus as the Christ and that he's not blaspheming and that this is the continued revelation of God. Well, very similar, and we actually read the, the, the story from Luke of the road to Emmaus when Jesus met those disciples and did pretty much the same thing. He, he from the Old Testament, told them um, how he was 
um, uh, or how the Old Testament talked of him. So Stephen is really following very closely in the footsteps of Jesus here. And this is the theme that will come up over and over and over again. There are so many uh, similarities between the way Stephen is um, teaching and the examples that he's using and Jesus and even the people that he uses like Joseph, uh, I mean, and the closeness to um, Jesus. Well, as far as we got in the um, sermon is pretty much when Stephen said, hear me. <laughs> And uh, then he w would launch into the sermon. So we're still sort of in the prologue. And I read you um, a piece from Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, of how significant that is um, and how what Stephen has to say was exactly what the, the, the Sanhedrin needed to hear. These men who thought they were so righteous but were as lost as you can be. Um, they needed to hear the gospel and that's exactly, of course, what the world in which we live in um, needs to hear. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, nonetheless, let's go ahead and, and, and jump into the, the sermon itself. Now, I want you to notice that uh, uh, Stephen's purpose, it, it, what, what he kind of sets out to do, we'll talk about this several times as we make our way through the text. But notice that he, he he's on trial, okay? He, he is before the Sanhedrin. He's literally in the last few minutes of his life. They're going to take him out and, and stone him. And rather than to defend himself, Rather than to try to say, no, no, I'm not doing this. Let, 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 me, let me explain from Scripture why I shouldn't be um, held as a blasphemer. Stephen shows us the, 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 the way of a true martyr because he is more concerned in the souls of the men who are getting ready to stone him than he is about his own life. So when he goes into this sermon, just keep in mind that his purpose is not to exonerate himself. He's not trying to, to get off here. He has no question. He's going to preach and teach the truth. And of course, that truth is going to infuriate them um, uh, and uh, uh, make them um, angry. So as I said earlier, he is going to use a very familiar history. In other words, if, 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 if you just looked at this from a precursory sense and, and, and you put yourself as a student uh, of history and you look at who Stephen is talking to, you might say to yourself, well, that's kind of a, of a silly way to go about this because you're talking to men who know this history inside out. So why are you sharing history with them? Why are you sharing something that they know? And, and they're probably all sitting there like, okay, you know, how dare you come here and lecture us on redemptive history? Don't you know we're the scribes and the, the chief priests and, and all these people? But um, once again, it, he, he is, he's using it, he's sharing the good news, he's sharing the gospel, he's exonerating Jesus and not himself, but he's using something that was extremely familiar to these men, um, the, um, the, the redemptive history. And if they were paying attention, which most of them are not, but if they were paying the attention, attention, what they would pick up from Stephen is the flow of redemptive history. Part of what Stephen wants to get across is that redemptive history did not stop 400 years ago when the last prophet spoke and wrote, wrote it down. That redemptive history continues. In fact, redemptive history has just culminated in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he wants them to get the flow because when you get the flow of redemptive history, you see that 400 years ago, it's incomplete. There, something needs to continue. You know, the, it was apostasy that the later prophets were talking about and looking forward to the Messiah. And so it, you, you see the natural flow of things and that is exactly um, um, 
what he is doing. But the second thing that he is doing, and, and this is what's so fascinating, and we'll get to it, hopefully I'll be able to bring it out, is in a sense, this is a reprimand. It's a reprimand just like Jesus reprimanded the scribes and Pharisees, not as harsh as Jesus until the very end, but um, a reprimanding the scribes and Pharisees, calling them hypocrites and you know a, a, a group of vipers and, uh, and, and all kinds of things. It's a reprimand for being like the men that they idolize. And, and that's what's going to be so interesting about this history is that he's going to bring out some of the egregious sins of the men that they are placing on a pedestal and, and, and then reprimand them for acting just like those men who uh, ha had come before. And, and that will come out uh, uh, you know, as, as we begin to make our way through this. But there's one more thing before I, I get into the actual text of his sermon that I, I want you to also see. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot of things you're supposed to hold in your mind as we go through this, but uh, I, I just want you to see that this is more than just a, a history lesson or, or, or a travelogue um, if, uh, of uh, of the of the way the Israelites came into um, to be in the land that they're in, but I told you that that this is the most complete um, pr a sermon that we have to date. But what I haven't brought out and is very important to us, this is actually the first full presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have in New Testament Scripture. It, it really, where someone starts from start to finish and a post, post gospels, after the gospels. But when someone starts out and says, okay, let me share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. There, there, there's, this is really the first presentation of the gospel that we have. And so therefore, I think if this is the first time and the most complete time that we see a full sharing of the gospel. Granted, there's a particular group that Stephen is sharing to, and we should take that in consideration. But I also think we should pay attention to his method. I, I think we should kind of look at the way that what he keys on, um, what he wants to make sure that is said about the, the, the gospel so that when we share the gospel, when we have our own method of telling people about Jesus, that we kind of uh, follow that model. I, I, th I think that is significant. So with that said, Let's jump into the start of the gospel. That's lowercase Roman numeral one. Looks like an I to you, but it's not. Um, the start of the gospel. And Stephen starts out right where the gospel should start out. And that is with the God of glory. And you know something? This runs completely counter to most modern methods of sharing the gospel. In most modern methods, it starts with the individual, it starts with their needs, it starts with your sins can be forgiven, it starts with God loves you and has a plan for your life, you know, he's working with you. But Stephen started it out by speaking of the God of glory. Now, on the one hand, what he's doing is he's showing them, hey, wait a minute, this is the same God you worship. All right, so this isn't a new God. We haven't created some new God that we are worshiping. This is the, this is the God of glory. Um, so uh, unfortunately, if, if the gospel starts with the individual and their need for salvation, um, I, I, I think that we have missed the point. Usually when I start out with the gospel, um, the big problem that we have in our day it is not so much the the uh, 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 for me to tell people how their sins can be forgiven. The big problem is convincing them that it matters that they sin at all. You know, and the only way that that really is going to matter to them 
is if they understand that there truly is a God and he is the God of glory, that he is a holy God. And, and so we start really with God, with, with uh, the, the fact that, uh, of talking about who God is when we um, uh, talk about the gospel. That's certainly the way that um, Stephen is going about it. And as I said, um, Stephen is making a point. Not only is he God's man, but so is Jesus. And, 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 and we're not talking about a, a different God. We are uh, revealing more about the same God than perhaps you had um, ever seen. So and, and, and he wants to make the point that Jesus and his ministry his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his coronation, his rule, his uh, promise to come again, all of this, all of these are the sovereign, providential work of God in redemptive history. That's the, boy, that's the focus of, of, his, of his sermon. He wants this to flow from literally from God's first, uh, he could have actually gone back to the garden. He doesn't. He goes back to Abraham. But he, he wants that, that the, the entire discussion of what God's plan is for humanity to flow and to show that um, all that they have missed and closed their minds to and closed their ears to, um, all of this is, is part of God's plan. So before any discussion of how this fits into God's plan, Stephen makes sure that he, um, uh, he lets people know that this is the same author um, of, of that plan, the same author who, um, uh, who, who, who made all the things. Um, and and I've, talked to, I've said several times that one of the things that Stephen wants to do here is to create a flow, to establish the flow of redemptive history. Well, redemptive history starts with God. Everything is from God to man. Now, remember, he's talking to a group of legalists on the one hand, the Pharisees and the scribes, and on the other hand, the Sadducees, the chief priests, the liberals who have pretty much de-supernaturalized God completely. And so what he is doing is establishing that this what, I'm, what, what, what I am teaching, what I am preaching is something that originates with God. It does not originate with man. It, it, is, a, it, it is a religion of grace, and he's, that's where he's headed with this. And it is not a religion where you set up a bunch of uh, legalistic um, uh, things to do like the Pharisees had done and like Jesus truly um, fought them on and, and, and consider that to be salvation. He starts with God. He moves through the patriarchs and the covenants. He starts really with Abraham and then goes to Jacob and then to the 12 tribes of Israel from there. He is going to take us through Joseph. He's going to present Joseph as sort of a type of Christ, if you will, and uh, show that, that, that the, um, the brothers treated Joseph in exactly the same way that they treated Jesus uh, in, in a reprimand. It is going to move into the Egyptian bondage and Moses and the deliverance from that. And once again, the um, covenant that God made with Moses, not only for the people, but also for the land in which they lived. And then finally to David and the temple and, and Solomon. Now, does anyone initially see a reason that he might be creating that flow, and I'll give you a hint, considering what he has been accused of. What is he trying to do with this flow? Starts with God, goes to Abraham, through Jacob, through the patriarchs, through Moses, right on into David and Solomon and the creation of the temple. Okay, what's he been accused of? Two things. Blasphemy. blasphemy. Why? Why is blasphemy? So you're speaking against Moses. And? God, the and the temple. 
Okay. So, so, so what has he done? He's gone back and he's going to establish the redemptive plan of God before the temple existed. He's going to show that the temple didn't come along till way after God had created this, this covenantal relationship with, with Abraham and, 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 and then, then, then Moses and the tabernacle, but then eventually the temple. So to, to say that he's blaspheming God because of the temple, well, Stephen's going to take them, going to leapfrog the temple and take them back and say, now, wait a minute, look what God did with Abraham. That was a covenant of grace. And, and, and we'll see it. So he, there's, there's method in his madness in the way that he is uh, going about this. Um, the, again, um, a, a natural progression that will ultimately lead to Christ and then a scathing commentary on the people who were there and the fact that they murdered him. You know, very similar to what Peter said at, at Pentecost. And of course, they are already sort of inflamed and they're going to stone him because of it. So that's kind of where we're headed. Now, the title, God of Glory, um, really can only be found one other place in Scripture. That's Psalm 29. I gave that to you, verse 3, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The God of glory. What, what is so special about that? What is so nice? I, I mean, wh why would Stephen pick this out? And it's only used one other time in all of Scripture. What, what, by referring to the God of glory, why is that such a special uh, uh, title for God? What, 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 when we talk about God's glory, what does that say? I mean, how does that fit in to all the other things that we know about God? His, his whole plan is, was designed to glorify him. Right, the whole plan was designed to glorify him. But when we talk about God as the being, he is, holy. he's holy, he's... His glory is a manifestation of his holiness. And? Keep going. Keep unapproachable going. light. What? Unapproachable light. Unapproachable light, but I mean, keep, keep going with the attributes. It, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient. He's eternal, he's infinite. infinite. Perfections. Perfection and all of these things, every one of his attributes is wrapped up in his glory. So to say the God of glory, you're talking about the God and you could go list through every exalted piece of language in scripture and it is incorporated in the concept of the God of glory. It, 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 all of those things are all wrapped up in there. And so um, it's, it's, it's a really good way to start. You're talking about not just the God who lives in glory, right? Not just the God who glorifies his name, but you're talking about the God who is glory, okay? In and of himself, he is the God of glory. Beautiful, beautiful way to, to start it out. I mean, just really kind of puts it into the right perspective. Okay, this is the God that I'm going to make a point is at work in the culmination of Jesus Christ. So, with that good start, any questions about that? Any thoughts uh, um, uh, about where we are so far before we... Yes, ma'am. Um, well, since since you made the point that this only appears one other place. Maybe um, something else he's doing is this is a pretty. This would be a pretty good attention grabber for um, someone that they would consider maybe not very learned, etc. Yeah. Um, of uh, hmm, this is only one 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 spot. We knew we knew where that is, but this guy does too. So maybe yeah. that's just a little subtle way of saying, hey, I'm worth listening to. Oh, absolutely. And if you remember. Um, and when we were getting introduced to Stephen, um, we, he was preaching and teaching in their synagogues and um, that no one could stand against him. No one could match his wits. No, no one could um, debate him because he was, he just had that, that presence. And also remember, when he's here, what does his face look like? 
was like an angel, okay? So not only, it's not like he's being arrogant with this knowledge, he is being loving um, with that. So um, a, a truly, um, um, I, I think a, a good start. Okay, onward and upward. Abraham and the patriarchs, um, that's from Roman numeral two. Um, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Now, that's where he's going to go, and I, I've mentioned it several times. He's going to go back to um, the, the, the very patriarch of the faith, the, the father of, uh, of all um, Judaism, um, of the worship that they consider to be their worship. They, 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 they know Noah, they, they know the covenant of Noah, but really when they trace their heritage, they traced it to Abraham because Abraham was the, 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 the true patriarch of, uh, of their faith. And so therefore he's, uh, he's headed back there and it, he's, he's using ex exalted language. Um, now, he wants them to know that not only is this the God of glory, but this is also the very same God who uh, um, started with the, the father Abraham. Um, what, was, it, was it something I said? No. Is she going to get the... Because it, it is warm. We do need to probably do that. Um, anyway, notice this. And, and I know that some of this is just technical, but I, again, I, I think it's very important. Notice that um, if, if, Abra if, if Stephen was standing before this group and was giving a dissertation on temple practices or on... Um, rabbinic writings. Um, if he wasn't a heretic, but he was going to give them a completely orthodox um, uh, discussion, this is the way he would start. He would take it back to Abraham and start tracing his argument through redemptive history. So you really can't get much orth more orthodox than this to, to go back and uh, ascertain that there is one God and that God is Yahweh. You remember the Shema and I gave it to you that they quoted, good Jews literally quoted this at least one a day, <coughs> sometimes uh, many more times a day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, and, and Stephen is there to impress upon them that um, he's, he's not talking about another God. Um, he's talking about a, a deeper, a more complete manifestation of Yahweh and not some idol God. Um, so in, in a sense, there's no more orthodox way that he could start out this sermon than to say, um, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Um, now, I know you guys love it when we talk about discrepancies in Scripture, but um, I think that it's it, it's it's valuable for you to know the truth because we we do live in a world where people love to rip apart the Old Testament and to find faults in it. And quite often a skeptic will bring this up as a clear-cut contradiction um, in Scripture. But if anyone does this to you, then um, know that they really just don't know their Scripture. And that somebody has probably told them that this is a contradiction. And um, uh, so they really don't know it. And that's why I want to explain it to you. Notice what uh, the rest of this verse says. And he appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Now, the reference to Mesopotamia is a reference to where? Where was, where, where was he from originally? Well, Babylon, yes. Babylon was just north of the town that he was in with his father Haran. Where was that? What town was he in? Ur. Ur. Ur is in what would today be southern Iraq. 
um, it, it's down towards modern day Kuwait. Um, in between where Babylon would have been and where Kuwait is, that's where the city of Ur was. And the city of Ur, we'll talk about it later on, it was a very bustling, metropolitan, successful, prosperous, and, and in terribly wicked um, city. But nonetheless, that's where Abraham and um, uh, uh, his family were living. Um, but now here's what, here's what Moses says in Genesis, and I gave you Genesis 11:31. Um, Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran that was the brother that died his grandson and Sarai his daughter-in-law his son uh, his son Abram's wife and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan but when they came to Haran they settled there now if you look at a map Haran is actually north, you would go north up through Iraq, um, literally to Syria it is, it is where Haran is. And then I think what they planned on doing is you, you kind of had to take that route. They were going to come back down south and go to Canaan, but for whatever reason, they remained in Haran. So that's where Abraham is living with his father and his, his wife. They're, they're already married but they're living there in Haran. Now, once again, Haran was another um, prosperous metropolitan area. And um, also, in, in, as all cities in those days were, horribly wicked and, and um, um, uh, evil that went on there. But anyway, when we get to um, the 12th chapter of Genesis, this is what we read. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the world shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Okay, according to Moses, where did God call Abram? Where did he call Abram from? Haran. According to Stephen, where did God call Abram? Ur. Well, that's in Mesopotamia. Okay. So, what's the solution to that? Hey, that's not bad. Good. <laughs> um, how, you, you know, there's two ways to approach Scripture. One is as an unbeliever, and the other is as a believer. And when you're a believer and you believe especially that, that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, then rather than looking for reasons to disbelieve, you look for harmony. And, and, and that's what uh, you know, scholars like Calvin and others have done with the Gospels. They've harmonize the Gospels to where all of these supposed conflicts are seen in a believer's light compared to other parts of Scripture, and then they make perfect sense. So obviously what happened here, and by the way, um, you, you do have to remember what we have learned about Stephen, all right? Stephen is standing up in front of Sanhedrin, and I gave you the verse there in Acts 6-5. What have we learned about Stephen? That he's a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. So if he has been dr being driven along by the Holy Spirit, what does that mean about his facts? They're right. They're 100% accurate. So rather than saying, oops, he, he says he's called from Ur, and he says he's called from someplace else, um, you look at it and you say, well, that's not necessarily a conflict, right? Because just uh, as Sonia said, um, this, this is uh, obviously he was called in Ur 
and he was called also in Haran. And here's the way that I, I look at it. By the way, I also gave you a couple of other references, and, all, and that's, this is when I say that if anyone throws this at you, it's because they don't know their scripture. If they say there's a conflict between Stephen and Moses, well, just pull Genesis 15, 7 uh, out. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you up out of where? Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. That's the same writer, just a few chapters apart. You, you know, he's, he's making the same thing. And Nehemiah says the same thing. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name of Abraham. And so therefore, even within scripture, we have harmonized, we have a harmony to, to show that it, 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 it's not a conflict. So here's the bottom line. In Ur, God in some way appeared to Abram. In some way, he manifested himself to Abraham and said that I'm going to call you out of your home and take you to a land you've never seen before. And then in Genesis, when he's living in Haran and God says, okay, time to go. I told you we're leaving. I told you that this is what's gonna to happen to you. So now it's time to pack up. Time is right, let's go. So basically, no, 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 no problem there. But the first time he moved, he moved with his father. Right. So he talked his dad into moving with him to wherever God was leading him? I, actually, I think that it was um, Terah, his father, who instigated that move. In, 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 yeah, in, in fact, let me go back and, and take a look at that. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot and, 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 and moved him to Haran. So it sounds like he was the instigator there um, that, that took him uh, up to Haran. So um, now, of course, they're all within the providence of God here. So, you know, um, they were all idol worshipers at the time. So God is, is working upon them and not um, because they knew what, there was, what was going on. Okay. Um, so God calls Abraham while he's still in Ur and says, I've got a plan for you and, and, and I'm going to call you out of here. And they, they head out, uh, but they only get to Haran and um, God says, okay, now it's time um, that you, uh, um, that you, uh, um, uh, that you leave. And by the way, this is not just a biblical um, um, uh, harmony. You, you find uh, this also in the writings of Josephus and Philo, um, two ancient writers um, that back this up. So in other words, no, no, no um, 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 discrepancy. And by the way, another reason that I like to do that is I just like to I think we should all have that mindset, a mindset where we start from the perspective that, hey, what do I know about scripture? I know that it is God's word, that it was breathed by the Holy Spirit. The men who wrote it down are being driven along by the Spirit, therefore there can't be any mistake in it. So rather than looking for a mistake, let's, let, let's look for a way that this is harmonized. And, and usually there's very few times in scripture that it's not very easy to harmonize it um, as, as this one is. Okay, um, any questions? I realize this is a little bit of a technical part of it, but let's move on in to the more interesting part. Okay, so um, this, uh, in, in number three, the seeds of the gospel from verse three. Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Of course, this is the beginning of the reason that the Jews are where they are, right? This is the reason that they have the land of Canaan because God is going to take Abraham there and show him this land and give it to him, although he himself is not going to, to do it. Now, as I said before, and, and again, this is what I want us to do all the way through this, I want us to try to get inside Stephen's head. 
I don't want us to see this just as a, a history lesson. I want you to see it as a presentation of the gospel um, in a way that his audience would indeed understand it. So to do that, we need to get inside his head uh, and the reason that he starts with God moves to Abraham and establishes his own orthodoxy. Um, uh, he, 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 he is interested in breaking the shell of some really hard-hearted people. Um, talk about a tough group of people to share the gospel with. Um, these, you, I don't know that you can get any tougher, but that's, that's his purpose is he wants to make sure that um, he, in his dying breath, at least can, can um, face the Lord and say, I, I was trying when they took me, Lord. Um, uh, and so with that said, let's take a look at, at Abraham. Now, this is not going to be totally new to you because um, actually um, I, 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 I didn't use this text, but I used the original text from, um, from Genesis 12, 1 several weeks ago when um, I, I, I preached a, a sermon on get, get the out, um, get out of the land that you're in, and um, made some associations. Uh, and, and, and in that, I made some of the same associations that I'm going to make here because that's what Stephen's doing. He, he's making those associations about Abraham. So um, let, let's, let's see if we can find um, the gospel in this. Now, one of the things, again, that we as Reformed students of the Bible look to do, and it's one of the reasons that I get so upset when people tell me that the Old Testament is yesterday's news and we don't need it anymore, um, because the entire Bible from one cover to the next is a story of Jesus Christ. The gospel is throughout the pages of the Bible and the beautiful imagery of the gospel, of God's love, of his grace, of his plan is written on the pages uh, of histories, of, of the Psalms, of the Proverbs. I, I mean, you, you, you can not find a place um, uh, where the gospel isn't being shared in some way or another. Even a book like Esther where the name Yahweh is not even used, but still you see such beautiful symbolism. Even Song of Solomon, which some people have a, a hard time reading, you know, because of, of, uh, of the nature of the text. That's, that's a love story to Jesus. Um, so they're just all the way through that scripture. So I wanna make sure that we, we notice that about what um, Stephen is doing. And I think take it to heart that that's a really good way for us to be looking at scriptures too. Anyway, let's remember, especially, and to me this is one of the most vital parts of this study of Abraham, and that is that Abraham is from pagan stock. I, I, I mean, we, we, we don't ever think of Abraham, the man of faith, the friend of God, the man who was willing to take his own son Isaac and, and, and kill him because he knew God would raise him from the dead again. This man with unwavering faith that, that was credited to him as righteousness, it's hard for us to think of him as a pagan, as an idol worshiper, as a moon and a star worshiper. But that's the, that's, that's the household he was raised in and both of the places he lived, Ur and Haran, were steeped in idol worship, uh, and, and this is verified. Don't take my word for it. I gave you Joshua 24, 2, who makes this absolutely clear. Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. I mean, you can't get any more explicit than that. So not only was Abraham's father, but probably his father's father and father's father's father, and as long as you could go back, were all idol worshipers. Those were wicked, wicked cities, as I've said before. And they were also um, worshipers uh, of, and especially in those days, quite often the worshiping of gods would, would be it with 
uh, with idols that they would carry around. But there was an awful lot of worshiping of the sun and of the moon and of the stars and, and that kind of, of animism. So um, that was uh, especially Haran. That's what they were known for is moon worshipers and a whole, uh, you know, a, con uh, a, a, a group of different ways that they would, they would worship that. Um, but also, as I said, these cities were were cesspools of of of, of sinfulness and um, avarice. Y you know, there there are so many great themes in Scripture, and I don't have time um, to do it now. But it's a it's a study that I'm threatening to do. Um, I'm threatening. Um, I keep thinking about it, um, but. You, you, you know that almost immediately, well, some time elapses after Cain kills Abel. Do you remember the first thing that we hear that Cain did? did he, like, build a city or something? he built a city and he named it after his son. Okay. So there in the very beginning, and of course, you know, he, they, they're, they're right on down to Lamech and others, you, you start seeing that evil and it deteriorated to the point of the flood. But uh, immediately there is what is known as the city of man, okay, the city that man makes. And over and against this is the city not made by human hands that, that Hebrews talks about. Of course, St. Augustine wrote a fantastic book, you know, it's a big book called The City of God, and he makes that distinction between the cultures of the cities that humans have built and the culture of the city that God is building, the, 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 the kingdom of heaven, and how we are citizens of that city and not of these cities, cities of man and kingdoms of men. Well, these cities that Abraham lived in, they were, the, I mean, they, they were great examples of these cities that had been created in a sinful environment and were idol worshipers with every kind of vice and sin and evil that you could possibly imagine. Um, great examples. And, and I've also said it before, these are the kingdoms. If you can imagine this. I mean, it's just hard for me to imagine this. Um, these are the kingdoms that the devil flashed in front of Jesus to try and tempt him. And, and can you imagine that? Because we're not talking about, you know, the land of Oz. We're not talking about good cities with good kings and good people. We're talking about evil, wicked places that were all about money and and sensual um, avarice and prostitution and idol worship and and murder and everything wrong that humanity does to each other. The exact opposite of the Ten Commandments. You're going to find them in these kingdoms, and those are the kingdoms that Satan flashes in front of Jesus and actually thinks that he's going to fall for it. Do you remember why, when we studied that in Luke, why that was a real temptation for Jesus? Do you remember what caused that to be a real temptation? Isn't that why Jesus came to save the people? Yeah, it's the people in those cities. It's the lost right. in the cities. And and, and so, yeah, it, it, the, 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 the city itself meant nothing. But the people, you know, when, when he looks upon people like that, he has compassion because they're lost uh, like sheep without a shepherd. And, and so, yeah, that, that, that was the real reason that he did that. Well, this is the environment that Abraham grows up in. Is it just me? Or have you ever imagined Abraham as a boy? He's always an old man. Have you ever thought about Abraham as a boy running around, you know? Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I mean, when, when we pick up on Abraham, he's 75 years old. I mean, okay, so he's always, uh, uh, you know, because uh, from, from there he just gets older and older. So uh, I, it's hard for me to imagine 
Abram the boy going home and Terah saying, okay, family, let's get together and worship the moon god. And Abraham, you pay attention. You know, I just can't imagine that, but that's the kind of environment that he was raised in. And that's significant because that's what God, that's where he was when God called him. He wasn't already Mr. Righteous and Mr. Faith. And it wasn't like people were preaching Yahweh on every corner. You know, and, and, and like that, nobody knew who Yahweh was. I mean, no, nobody had any clue. Everybody was worshiping other gods. And so that's why this calling is so, um, uh, so, so spectacular, so amazing. Well, the second thing that we want to notice about Aram, stop me if you have any questions, okay, because I'll just keep going, all right, or some, in, any um, thoughts. Um, the uh, second thing that I want to bring out about this story that Stephen is getting ready to tell us about Abraham and the association, I mean, I don't think most of us would make all those associations in our minds, but these people did, all right? The Sanhedrin did. They, they knew this stuff. So they, they have almost deified Abraham, but they also knew where he came from and, and they knew how God had called him. Um, so Abraham, without question, is a product of grace. And brothers and sisters, please mark this down in your head somewhere, or, or if, if not if physically, that he's a product of grace. That when Stephen goes to Abraham, he is going to grace. He's talking to legalists. He's talking to temple worshipers and corruptors. But he goes back and he makes the point that Abraham was called out of idolatry and darkness and wickedness. What merit are we given in any of the story of Abraham that would cause God to call him? What goodness? What works has he done? What legalist situation that he had? And Paul makes much of this, you know, when he's talking about circumcision and he's trying to fight that um, aspect is that, you know, God called Abraham before he was circumcised. You know, he, 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 he it was a covenant of grace. And so uh, Abraham is absolutely the product of grace. So he did not call him as a decent, good man, but as a God forsaking pagan, all right, as best as we know. And so what does that mean, folks? What does it mean about the call of God? We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it, but who does it? God does. The God of glory does it. Who did it? Did Abraham reach out for God? No. Did Abraham say, God, I want to follow you. I need to get my family out of here. I'm tired of worshiping idols. Uh, you know something? I want to choose you. No. God chose, chose Abraham out of, out of people that didn't know him at all. So it was 100% God and 0% Abram. All right? So... That's what Stephen has done. He has established salvation by grace. Okay? All right? He said it for the gospel, but that's what he's done. And with Abraham. Okay? So, it was God who reached out to Abraham. It was all God's uh, um, initiative. Um, two things that he's established, as I just said. Um, the story of Abraham is the story of, one, God's sovereignty and two, God's grace, okay? The very things that we preach as reformers, as the foundation of the gospel, it is God's sovereignty and election and his grace to choose the likes of us who have no reason, no claim, no merit, no ability, no reason that he should call any of us. Oh, don't feel bad, it's the same with Abraham, the very patriarch of the faith. So that's, um, that's why we, we refer to the covenant that God makes with Abraham as the covenant of grace um, and, and not uh, of something else. Um, now, it's also, as we will find later on, um, what was the other aspect of that covenant that um, became so evident in 
and Abraham. I didn't ask that question very well. Um, yeah, let me, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase it, okay? We've talked about this has been a covenant that, a, that, that Stephen has established, at least implicitly, that, it, that Abraham was called by grace. What else was Abraham the father of that was very central to his calling and the outcome of that calling? Uh, so that's still not, that's still not, I'm just going to tell you because I, 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 I can't figure out a good question, a uh, way to do that. Well, I can do it uh, from Genesis 15, 6, and Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So was it a, what was, was it a, covenantal relationship that started? Was it a relationship that had anything to do with works? First of all, not with Abraham, but anything with works. What was the, what was the, the, uh, the manifestation of the grace of God? Abraham believed. Abraham believed. Where did, where did that belief come from? God. Okay, <laughs> seriously, you, I mean, just, just put yourself in Haran. We're all going to worship the moon God. Right? Nobody, not a single person is, is preaching about Yahweh. And all of a sudden, Abraham believes God enough just to pick up, move his family. Let's go. Where are we going, God? I'm not going to tell you. I just want you to go. Okay? Now, be honest with me. Everybody knows that story. But how many of you have actually thought about the fact that Abraham didn't know God at all when he was called. Don't you just assume that there was a relationship there? That he knew God and God had been revealing himself to him and he's going to the synagogue to hear more about God? None of that. None, I know there's no synagogue and there's no, nobody knows Yahweh. And that's, that's the most amazing part of it. All of this happens. So it happens through grace. It happens through faith. And, 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 and where did the faith come from? The sovereign gift of God. Abraham didn't have faith. It's not like he was born with it. Yes, ma'am. Um, was, was grace talked about in the Old Testament? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah. All right. I mean, so is faith. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a consideration. God is the God of grace, always has been. And this is, the story of Abraham is a story of God's grace. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of a passage, but I'm not good at that. Yeah, and, um, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Declaration of himself. Doesn't God who is gracious and, and uh, merciful. merciful. He certainly calls himself merciful, so that would be uh, um, um, extending, right, extending forgiveness to many, but by no means will forgive the guilty. Yes, good. That that is that is one, and I imagine they're laced all through the Psalms. You know that uh, that we talk about. So he appeared like in the smoking pot in the uh, torch. Isn't that pretty? That's, that, would, that, that is exactly the same thing. That's 100% God and 0% Abraham. You know, that's, that's, yeah, Abraham's just, he's, he's there and, and God walks through those pieces twice. You know, so yeah. So, so many very profound pictures of God is a God of sovereign grace, you know, uh, and, and we're, we're definitely seeing that. God giving Lot a chance of escape when Absolutely. he did, Everything but earn that. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and and poor Mrs. Lot who <laughs> had to just take one last look. Another good verse is from Exodus 33, where God says, "I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy." So it's just yeah. that's great. Yeah. So there you have sovereignty and grace at the same time. Yeah. So thank you. So those are those are are, are, are good verses. Um, so, we have grace, we have faith, we have sovereignty, um, 
And again, we see that Stephen is laying the groundwork, even though he's talking about patriarchs, something that everybody agrees on, he's laying the groundwork for the gospel, okay? Um, and, and, and once again, you know, when, when, when you mention Lot's, um, Lot, and then I think about Lot's wife, um, I find myself, my mind drifting back to um, Pilgrim's Progress so many times. I don't know if you've read the second uh, or, or uh, there, but they, they run across Lot's wife uh, in, in their travels. Um, and yeah, the pillar is there because um, uh, they, they, they do a lot of discussion. But when we, when we talk about a man like Abraham, okay, just visualize this. Here's Abraham in Haran, this wicked city. And God says, I've got a place that I want you to go and I'll show you where it is. And he leaves that city what is that city like in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? City of Destruction. I mean, that's, that, that is um, the, 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 but because that city, sooner or later, is destined for destruction. So when God calls his people out of the cities of man, um, even though we live in this world, we're not to be part of those cities. He calls us out of it. And when he calls us out of it, he's calling us out of it because that is a city that is destined for destruction, okay? It's going to be, uh, uh, going to be destroyed. So actually, if you want to look at Abraham going on a pilgrimage, that's kind of what he's doing because where's he headed to the promised land, right? And that's the that's, that, that's the discipleship. That's what all of us are doing. We're making our, our way um, on our pilgrimage through this world. Sometimes we find nice places to stay. Sometimes it's great fellowship and we have the respite with our brothers and sisters. Other times he throws us in the darkness in the valley of the shadow of death and we have uh, n nothing but trouble. And then he moves us out of that into something else and grows us and, and finally uh, takes, us, takes us home. So um, it, 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 is a, it is not just a picture of grace and sovereignty. It really is. You, you look at this whole thing as a Christian pilgrimage. Because that's pretty much the story that um, um, Stephen is, is telling. And, and you know something? Um, another person I think about when we go through this is Martin Lloyd-Jones. Um, we ended up with him last week. And I don't, I don't have a quote. But um, he, he, in that quote that I, I read you last week, um, it was part of a, a larger work that, that he had done. Um, and, and actually, it was a work on this. It, it was a work on Acts. He, he um, just before he died, he, he wrote um, uh, commentaries on the first eight chapters. Um, and, and, and he's the one that kind of made the point, and I just kind of repeat it, is that, the world is under a tragic delusion. And the tragic delusion is that because God has not punished me yet, he won't punish me. Because everything's going along okay in my life, because um, I, I'm, I'm not getting stomped on or, or something horrible hasn't happened to me or my loved ones, then, then don't tell me about God who is going to be wrathful at my sins. If he was wrathful at my sins, boy, he would have struck me down with lightning uh, a, a hundred times by now. So therefore, because he has not in his forbearance and mercy and grace, he has not punished me yet, then I don't believe he ever will punish me. So therefore, I just kind of reduce him. He either is not paying attention or I water him down to where he's, he's not strong enough anymore, doesn't really care, or I create a God of my own manufacture and say, well, my God this and my God that. And that is one of the worst, most tragic, nefarious, evil lies that the enemy um, uh, teaches people. And you see it over and over and over again in people who just, you, you, you try to mention the word sin and they shut they shut down, you know, don't talk to me about sin, you know. And that's why so many 
presentations of the gospel have removed the idea of the sovereignty of God and remove the idea of the holiness of God. And it's not the God of glory that we start with. It's the God of tolerance. It's the God of understanding. It's the God of cosmic grandfather who winks at your sins and loves you no matter what you do, you know? It's not the God of glory because the God of glory talks about the entire panoply of who God is. And part of that is perfect holiness. And you can't have a perfectly holy God who is not wrathful at transgressions and blatant sinfulness. And so, therefore, I think it behooves us that um, when we share the gospel, when we talk about the good news of Jesus Christ, no, we don't need to be negative. We don't need to focus on just the hellfire and brimstone as, as you're, uh, by the way, you, you talk about a holy God, you're going to get accused of being a hellfire and brimstone person. But, um, but, but still, we are doing a horrible disservice to the world that we live in and the people that we talk to if we simply tell them or teach them that God is going to give you a pass. You know, he, he's just going to uh, he, he's just going to um, um, let you go. I was, I had the perfect opportunity the other day not to do this. Um, I talked to, um, I think it was, I think I talked about it in the service too, about my, my Jewish friend who, um, we, we have these conversations. Well, he had, he had an out and out asked me one time. He says, okay, you know, I, I kind of know your beliefs do you think I'm going to hell? And I could have said, well, you know, God is the God of love. Uh, and I, and I, I said, I do. It breaks my heart that you are, but it, you, you have spit back in God's face, you know, and, and all of a sudden a, a jovial conversation got really serious in a, in a hurry because you've spit back in God's faith. God, God has presented you with his plan of redemption and you have said, I don't care about it. And that marks you for, um, for eternal punishment. So yes, I, I, I'm, I love you and, and you're, you're a good friend, but yeah, you're going to hell unless you change your heart and accept God's re re redemptive plan for you. So I mean, extra chiropractic crack after that. <laughs> what, what, what makes you think it's my chiropractor? Oh. <laughs> I, I never said that. I, oh. I, I never revealed his, uh, yeah, his uh, I never revealed his identity. It could be someone else. Be someone else. But um, no, the, um, um, and, and, and that's where it ends. That, that's where you leave it, you know, um, because nobody wants to hear that. But I'm doing a terrible, horrible disservice if uh, to be a friend, to be friendly, to be nice, to be socially acceptable, to say, oh, no, sure, you know, God, God, God loves you, and all you got to do is believe in their heart, and, you know, hopefully someday he's going to, you know, you're going to see the truth. No, you ask me straightforward, are you going to hell? Yes. So, any questions? I'm going to leave it there. Because we're still, we're still in the midst of, uh, of, of looking at the gospel in the eyes of, of Abraham or the way that Stephen is, is relating it. So um, are, are there any questions, comments? Of, or, oh, yes, sir. You know, you, you were just talking about your friend, right? Um, and you said that God changed the heart. And it, it, so God hadn't changed his heart or because he's heard the gospel and didn't accept it, or, well, you know, or did God? There's this, there's this stone in there, right? Yeah. Like Ezekiel says. And Ezekiel says, I take the stone out and I put flesh in. But since we've been talking about Luke, you take the stone out and put nice, fresh, um, organic dirt there and you plop the seed of the gospel in there. That's got to happen prior to understanding the gospel. As soon as that happened and the gospel goes in there, 
and, and the Spirit regenerates that heart, it's impossible for that soul to reject the gospel. When the Holy Spirit changes that soul and makes it a, um, a, a regenerate, born-again soul, then it's impossible for that soul to say, no, I, 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 you know, thanks, but no thanks. So that's what Sister Dean was saying was, God would have mercy on whom he would have mercy on him. So, so it's not the person's fault, it's God's fault. Well, no, no. Let's let, let's let, let's put that into perspective. Um, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't use that language. It is his fault, a hundred percent his fault. He is following his fallen, wretched, God-hating nature, and he is rejecting God's plan of salvation presented to him. It is one hundred percent his fault, and he is culpable for spitting in the face of God. Not, not fault, but, but it is God. it is that. Right, God has not chosen to extend mercy upon that soul and regenerate it. Although I pray that he will, that's all I can do, it's all we can do, and I hate it when people say that, so I'd let me take that back. That's the best thing we can do for someone who is recalcitrant, who is uh, rejecting the gospel, is to pray that God would, would redeem the heart. You know, um, because nothing's going to happen until that happens. Nothing's going to happen until God calls. Nothing's going to happen until, the, through His mercy, He changes that heart. Um, so, but the fact that God does not do that does not absolve the person who is acting according to their nature. Because that person enjoys the darkness and would rather be in the darkness than accept the light that is put right in front of them. He's the one that will take the jar and cover the lamp to snuff it out, throw it under a mattress so that he doesn't have to see the light because he prefers the darkness. Okay, so that's his own nature and he's acting according to that nature. So therefore, it's not that it's God's fault that he goes to hell, but it is God who chooses in his sovereignty not to change that heart. Now, if you really, really, really want to get down to it, I mean, what's the difference between choosing not to change the heart, you know, and, and sending someone to, to, to hell? Um, it, it, it's two sides of the same coin. You can't do one without the other. You know, you can't choose not to save somebody and say you didn't reject them. You, you know what I mean? I, I mean, we, we can play with language, but... That's what is called double predestination or reprobation, and it makes you a hyper Calvinist. <laughs> so, so the, the gospel is the power of, uh, not if it is, it is the power. Uh, and the job that you do, and we as Christians, as, as uh, witness for Christ, is that gospel do not be preached or evangelized. But then you said, I'm still, I'm still, even all these years I've been coming, I'm trying to understand the fact that, you, you know, the change of heart, I guess it's prior to even the gospel being preached or evangelized, then that heart has to be changed prior to man accepting Christ. Right. Right. It's the, the gospel is still the power of salvation. And God has ordained that it will be spread throughout the human race by the likes of us, you know, and, and his word. Um, so that it's, it's, it's still there's the gospel has to go forward because it's the gospel that is the hope. But the, but, but the issue is, is um, how, and Abraham's a great example. Okay, how does Abraham get faith? Where does faith come from? Yeah, how does a man have ears or a woman have ears to hear? You know, when my ears are shut and they're dull and, and, and I can't hear the gospel and it bounces off of me 
And, and, and we, we all know that to be true. I mean, how many times did I sit in a church and listen to the gospel being shared and, I, and I, I'm just looking at my watch hoping I get out of there. I mean, it's just bouncing right off of me. So the gospel is having zero effect on me until God changed my heart and then all of a sudden everything in my world changed. And, and, and I, I, I can't look back at that and say, I did anything. I, I mean, I, I'm literally, I'm, I'm just there. And all of a sudden, where I didn't believe, now I do believe. And, and that's the changing of the heart. The gospel is still what makes the difference. I mean, the gospel is still the light that, that lights the fire. But the whole story of the parable of the sower is that if those seeds fall on the path, guess what? It's not going to take root because that heart is so hard, it just bounces right off of it. It's, it's got to be the, the soil. But who makes the soil? God. Right. Okay. All right. No. So, and, 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 and unfortunately, the reason that that remains um, somewhat uh, um, confusing is because it depends on which way you approach it. And there are so many voices out there that approach it from the opposite direction and they harp on it, they're very convincing, but they will use just a few verses where virtually the corpus of scripture says otherwise. So. All right, eight o'clock. Let me pray and I'll let you guys go. Next week we need to adjust that air conditioner um, on the way in. So. Father, as we, uh, as we look at this patriarch of the faith and we see amazingly that your calling of him so hugely significant to Judaism, to Islam, to the entire Arab nation, to Christianity, that you called him out of darkness just the way you called us out of darkness, that he had no more merit than we did or we do, and that his, his calling was by grace and his faith was by grace and everything that you did through him was by grace. And it was your sovereign will that was involved with every single step of it. Dear Lord, as we leave tonight, may we continue to worship you as the God of glory, not a God of our own manufacture, but the God who is above all things. And we consider your majesty in, in, in everything that we consider as far as you are concerned, your holiness, your, 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 your majesty, your supremacy, uh, and, and just worship, worship you as such. Bless everyone as they go home, keep them safe. Bring us back together, dear Lord, to worship you uh, this weekend. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Lord bless you, let me tell you in advance, just so that, um, um, you know, we will not meet on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We never do. That Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, we won't meet.